Good morning to you all and welcome to this meeting where we're watching our service either via Zoom live streamed or some of you will be watching this on um, YouTube pre-recorded and some may be watching it on a DVD or listening on a CD um, but uh, everybody has an opportunity to watch and be part of this service in some way or another so you're very very welcome. All the uh, notices uh, for the week are in living letters or they've come out in the midweek um, newsletter. So please uh, keep an eye on those and please keep praying for all the things that uh, um, we've posted there. We will keep you up to date if there are any other um, things we want people praying about. Today I'm very pleased to say that uh, we welcome the Reverend Susan Stevenson who will be leading our worship and preaching and uh, he, she will be assisted by Peter who will also be participating. We're very grateful to you both and uh, really believe that God has brought you to us at such a time as this. Good morning, everybody. I wonder what's keeping you going at the moment, going through these long winter lockdown days. What is it that gives you a lift, a boost? For me, it's often the things I notice on my daily walk. This last week, I've seen snowdrops, two gardens full of them, and, and daffodils, lots of daffodils beginning to poke up. Sometimes it's the vastness of the horizon or the pounding of the waves down on the beach. And I guess if you can't get out, it's all there on winter watch on the television for us to enjoy. Things like the murmuration of the starlings. All these things help to lift my heart into the greatness of God. And this morning, as we come to worship, we come to lift our heads, our eyes, our hearts, and to join our voices with the song of creation in worshipping the living God. Fill the earth with songs of worship tell the wonders of creation's king. Creation sings the Father's song. He calls the sun to wake the dawn and run the course of day till evening falls in crimson rays. His fingerprints and flakes of snow Upon the spinning globe, he charts the eagle's flight, commands the newborn baby's cry. Hallelujah! Let all creation stand and sing.
Father, you are the Lord and giver of life. And today we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the greatness of your love that spoke life into being and the greatness of your love that will not let us go. We thank you that you're willing to bear the pain of loving a world like this and that nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from your victorious love in Jesus, that love that raised Jesus from the dead. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to a faithless world. We thank you that you don't stand distant but draw so close that you are so close to us at this very moment, just where we are. Living, gracious, faithful God, we bless you, we worship you. In worship and in wonder, I behold your face, singing, what a faithful God, have I. First reading for today is from the book of Jonah and we'll be reading Jonah chapter 2 verse 10 to 3 verse 5 and then verse 10 and uh, we pick up the reading after the drama of Jonah being swallowed by 
a whale or was it a whale? No, I think the scriptures just tell us it was a big fish or a huge fish. That's what the NIV says. So we'll stick to that. And this is what God says after that event. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had planned. As God speaks to us through his word, we respond by spending a few moments praying for our hurting world. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. As we draw near to God in prayer, let's pause for a moment or two and think of someone you know who needs God's help at this time and ask God simply to touch their lives with his love. As a way of praying, take the opportunity now to speak aloud their names to God and in that way entrust them into God's loving hands. As we continue to pray, we pray for all who work in the National Health Service at this time. Father, we give you thanks for all those working in hospitals and in the community, for nurses and doctors, for cleaners and cooks, for porters and paramedics. Lord, we know how weary and wounded they are after this demanding year. Lord, give them the strength and energy they need as they continue serving others. Comfort them and renew them in body, mind and spirit, we pray. Lord, we also thank you for the staff who care for people living in care homes up and down the country. Grant to them the strength, comfort and support they need as they provide 24-7 care to the precious people entrusted to their care. Lord, we give you thanks for the increasing numbers of people who've been vaccinated against COVID and we pray that the distribution of vaccines will work well and that more and more people will be protected from harm. But Lord, as we give you thanks for this vaccination programme which offers a glimmer of hope to us, we pray for rich nations like ours, that we will not turn our backs on the needs of people in other nations. We pray that vaccines will be made available to people in the many nations who don't have a health service to rely upon. Lord, open our eyes to see the needs of others and open our hearts and hands in generosity towards them. And Lord, we pray for the new administration in the United States, for President Joe Biden and for Vice President Kamala Harris. Lord, grant to them the wisdom and courage they will need as they seek to lead that nation towards healing and a greater sense of unity. Please, Lord, frustrate those whose hearts are set on violence and empower all those who seek to work for peace and for justice. We offer our prayers in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Our next song this morning, I the Lord of Sea and Sky, helps us continue in that prayerful attitude. Then after the song, we'll listen to our second Bible reading from Mark's Gospel, and that will lead us into the first instalment of what's going to be a two-part sermon this morning. I will make the darkness rise. 
Now, second reading comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. And this is where Jesus announces the good news and calls his first disciples. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired man and followed him. Over this last year, we've all been very grateful for the work of scientists and researchers, very grateful for the different vaccines that are being developed against COVID-19. Now, being a scientist requires attention to detail, the ability to carefully tabulate all sorts of data. But if any of the scientists I know are anything to go by, it also takes imagination, the ability to imagine what seems impossible. So I wonder what the scientists among us, and indeed the rest of us, make of these words. How can you cope with the end of a world and the beginning of another? How can you put an earthquake into a test tube or the sea into a bottle? How can you live with the terrifying thought that the hurricane has become human, that fire has become flesh, that life itself came to life and walked in our midst? That's how one teacher and writer tries to capture in words something of who Jesus is. Who this Jesus is that Mark presents us with, striding along a Galilean beach, overturning people's lives. This Jesus who sees Peter and Andrew and James and John, and that doesn't just mean he catches sight of them, he sees them. And in seeing them, he claims them. This is the voice we later see has authority even over the wind and the waves. And this very same voice calls them to follow. And the amazing thing is that they don't think about it. They don't go and seek the advice of trusted friends. In fact, they don't do anything that we'd call sensible they immediately leave everything and follow. Now, if this were our children or our grandchildren, we'd be worried. But there was something so compelling, so authoritative in the call of Jesus. They knew that this is what they'd been looking for all their lives. And when you know, you know as our older son said when he proposed to his now wife just six months after they first met. When you know, you know. And when you know, you do something about it. I suspect lots of us this morning can remember when we first knew, first knew that Jesus was what we'd been searching for, even if we hadn't realised it before. The call of Jesus comes with the authority of the author of creation, the one through whom all things were made, in whom all things come together, the one who is a life itself come to life and walking in our midst. Jesus claims them and he gives them a new calling, a new identity and a new way of living a way of living that was risky. They were called out of their jobs, out of the family business. They were called to do something that cost the whole of their family. Something that went against the social norms. They were called to an apparently much less successful, much less secure life. But they heard the call of Jesus. 
and immediately, at once, without delay, they followed. It's astonishing. Many of us know something of the compelling power of this call. Maybe we're beginning to hear something of it again this morning. And yes, for some, it is to a new occupation. But very often, it's not about doing different things, but about doing things differently. Seeing the whole of life differently. Reorientating, turning the whole of our lives around to follow Jesus. The first thing that stands out in this passage this morning is the sheer impact of Jesus. And the second thing that stands out is the involvement, the intervention of God in history, in the here and now of history. Now at times during this last year, maybe there have been times when people have wondered where God is and what God's up to. But whether we're aware of it or not, the witness of the Bible is that God's always at work, behind the scenes, in the depths. But there are also times when we see God's hand breaking surface, like in this passage in Mark's Gospel. There's a hint of it in the very opening words. After John was put in prison, we read right at the beginning. The words in Greek actually say, when John was handed over. And it's important to notice that because it's the same phrase we find, for example, in Mark 9, 31, Mark 10, 33, uh, and then again in Romans, in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, where we're told that Jesus was handed over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. It's a phrase that holds together on the one hand human action, crucifying Jesus, putting John in prison, and on the other hand, the action of God's spirit moving forward, God's plans and God's purposes. So when Mark says, after John was handed over to prison, it's a signal to wake us up to the fact that in all of this, God is at work. God is on the move. After John was handed over and put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he says. The kingdom of God is near. Change your life and believe the good news. The time has come for God to retake this world he's created. The time has come for God in Jesus to defeat Satan and to triumph over sin and over every death-dealing power. The time has come for God in Jesus to redeem, to begin to put right the mess, the chaos, the injustice, all that's wrong with this beautiful but broken world. The reign of God is here in Jesus. So, says Mark, come on board and live in this amazing good news. A whole new world is coming. And don't we long for that? And not only those of us who are followers of Jesus. Isn't that what we're hearing all around us as well? We're living at a time where there is so much longing for something different, for something better, for individuals, and better too, for our whole hurting world. Follow me, says Jesus, and I will use you to be part of the answer to this world's longing. Come, follow me, says Jesus, and I will make you fishers of people. Now, those who've been through Sunday school, I guess, have been singing those words forever. I won't sing them to you, but yeah, I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men, if you follow me. 
But am I the only sensitive soul who feels a bit uncomfortable with that picture? I know lots of my non-Christian friends do. I mean, tell me, how is it good news for a fish to be caught and gutted and fried and eaten? Now, of course, Jesus was talking to people whose whole lives smelt of fish, whose whole lives were bound up with fish. So I guess it was an obvious thing to say. But there's also an echo here of the Jewish image of Satan fishing for those he can draw into his net. You remember how in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, there is a thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come, says Jesus, that they may have life, life in all its fullness. Come with me, says Jesus, and I will use you, yes, you, to be part of my bringing freedom and life to this world. We're going to pause before we come back and think a bit more. We're going to take a few moments to worship this Jesus, the one who is the hope of the nations. Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light and Truth in each circumstance You are the source of heaven's light on earth In history you lived and died You broke the chains, you rose to life You are the hope, living
the time has come, Jesus says. And the word for time in the Greek is the word kairos. A kairos moment is often a time of danger, a time of crisis, as it was here. John had been put in prison, an ominous sign of where this would lead for Jesus. It was a moment of crisis and of danger, but also a moment of opportunity. Today, we live at a Kairos moment for our world. The whole world is at a Kairos moment. Yes, there's danger, there are crises galore, but there is so much opportunity. So what is God saying to us here today at this Kairos moment? Just notice, would you? where the action in the gospel passage happens. It's not in the church, it's not in the temple, it's not in the synagogue, it is out in the world. And that's also where we find Jonah eventually, after doing his best to avoid it, in our first reading. And in the Jonah passage, you have to say that the people out in the world are a lot more attractive than God's chosen prophet a lot more ready to hear God's word than God's prophet is to deliver it. Often when I pray for the local community, wherever it is I'm living, I have this picture comes into my mind, this image of Jesus walking around the streets where I live, looking behind the closed doors, behind the drawn curtains, and longing, longing that people should know how much he loves them. And there's a voice I hear as I pray. Oh, my people, do you not feel the pain that is in my heart for those around you who are lost to my love? I've had two conversations this last week with people, local church ministers in different parts of the country who are sensing Jesus calling them out of local church ministry into something new. And I've just begun to wonder, just begun to wonder whether the ice flows are beginning to break up, whether God is beginning to open cracks of opportunity the other side of this COVID season. And whether more and more people are beginning to hear the call of Jesus out into opportunities God is beginning to open up. We thought this morning about the calling of Peter and Andrew and James and John. But I do sometimes wonder what Zebedee left in the boat, made of it all, as he watched his sons walk out of the family business to follow after Jesus. I wonder whether he heard God's call to, the call to let them go. I just wonder whether as a church <clears throat> we're going more and more to hear the call of God to let people go. Go to take the good news of Jesus to people outside and to grow church in different ways there different ways from the way we do it here on a Sunday morning. This morning, the same Jesus who came striding along that Galilean beach, overturning people's lives, is here among us. And at this Kairos moment, he is calling us, he is reclaiming us. We may not know what that means at the moment, but the question is, when we do know, will we obey? Will we be ready to change our lives and believe? Let's take a moment or two of quietness to sit at the feet of this Jesus and to allow what he has been saying personally to us perhaps to us as a church, to allow his words to sink deep within us and begin to take root 
and do their work. We take a few moments of quietness in the presence of our living Lord. Lord, as your spirit searches our hearts and our minds and our lives, we come to say to you this morning, here I am, Lord. I hear you calling my name. And I will go, Lord, as you lead me. Capture my heart, my life afresh today. And do in me what I cannot do in myself that many, many, many in this world you so love will taste your love for themselves and worship you. Lord, we come, we place our whole trust and confidence in you and wait for you to lead us to your glory. Amen. Amen.